Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap. We have some follow-ups on CTS Labs for this week, as well as uh, Intel Meltdown Inspector patch performance updates, a 2600X AMD Ryzen 2000 series CPU that's been listed on Amazon accidentally, and some other information on uh, ASRock being a GPU vendor, ASUS and the ROG X470 motherboard, Samsung power outages killing 30% of the flash supply for the month, things like that. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA and the X299 Dark motherboard for the Intel high-end desktop CPUs. The X299 Dark is one of the only motherboards on the market with proper VRM cooling. We've tested this and found a significant performance increase over those without active cooling on the VRMs. This board was used in our recent attempt to set a top 10 record in Firestrike. And you can learn more about the X299 Dark at the link in the description below. We have a brief update on CTS Labs and their security research, which alleged severe flaws in the AMD Zen architecture. If you're not up to speed on this story, we have a video on it on the channel already. But uh, to recap it briefly, CTS Labs is a new security company that put out some content that said these are a bunch of security vulnerabilities we believe we've found in the Zen architecture and they gave uh, AMD about 24 hours notice. They gave some journalists, as we understand it, earlier notice. And uh, also there was another company, Viceroy Research, that put out a 30 page insane tirade, like the ramblings of a lunatic, if you see our first video, uh, that really drew a lot of criticism for all of this. So as we said in the original content, the exploits appear to be rooted in legitimacy. Uh, however, the presentation of those exploits, we think, as an opinion, is highly unprofessional. So, uh, either way, we needed to dig more into it. We sent a bunch of questions over to their PR company, which did finally respond, by the way. And uh, some of those questions were not really answered. They're kind of skirted around. But one of the questions, uh, we, can, we can kind of put up the whole list of questions on the screen if you want to see it, and you just pause and read them. But one of the questions was about Ninewell's Capital with which uh, CTS Labs CFO Yaron Luke Zilberman has held a position in the past. We asked what the relationship was between Ninewells Capital, which is a hedge fund firm, and CTS Labs, and the company provided this statement, quote, Ninewells Capital is a lawn-oriented financial partnership that was managed by our CFO. He no longer actively manages that partnership, Nine Wells has no financial position in AMD, Intel, or any other semiconductor company. And that's a start. We still need some clarity on this because some really simple digging reveals an SEC filing recently that lists Yaron Luke Zilberman as the president of Nine Wells Capital as recently as March 8th, 2018. So perhaps that document is outdated or we're missing something. But uh, we need some clarity on that point because right now we're a bit confused on, on how those two things can be simultaneously true. Uh, we can't make any links right now, but we've asked for that clarity. Luke Silverman was also listed on the CTS Labs website as the managing director of Nine Wells Capital very recently too. So not really sure what to make of that. Uh, regarding Viceroy, we asked this question, what is CTS Labs affiliation with Viceroy Research? Did Viceroy commission CTS Labs for this report? And have the two companies had any previous connections or affiliation? The last part being the most important and thus uh, ignored. The response was as follows. Viceroy is not a client of CTS. We did not send Viceroy our report. Uh, for any additional questions, please ask Viceroy. So unfortunately, this sidesteps a lot of those questions, like the question about the affiliation between the two companies. There's some kind of there there's so here's the story viceroy research the president of it said in a an interview with reuters i believe that they received a leak of the cts labs document or a tip of the document prior to the document's publication this is how viceroy research had a 30 page tirade available within hours of the cts labs report going public because otherwise it's just physically impossible to do so the question that I have that is still not answered is uh, what connection is there between the two companies? Because CTS Labs is a small new company and somehow there's a leak that goes out to Viceroy Research 
and yet they claim they did not send Viceroy their report. So perhaps that's true, uh, and we'll certainly allow for that to be true until there's evidence otherwise. Either way, though, that's kind of what we have for now. Our most important questions were unfortunately avoided or ignored or, or not addressed plainly right now. We've followed up again. But uh, some of those included, for example, well, back to Viceroy briefly. Viceroy, after they got that document, by the way, said they stated on record that they took a sizable short position on AMD. So uh, a little bit weird. But anyway, we also asked the following. Does CTS Labs or do any of its employees currently hold a position on AMD in the stock market? We later followed up and said currently or in the past couple of weeks, uh, CTS Labs did not respond to this question. And further, Ian Cutris of Anantech and David Cantor of Real World Tech, with whom we've worked previously, uh, recently asked CTS Labs a series of questions on a phone call, including what their affiliation is with Viceroy Research, and CTS Labs immediately concluded the call upon that question being asked. Given the avoidance of answering our hardest questions and skirting answers to a few that were sort of addressed, we remain skeptical of the motives of CTS Labs, or in the very least, of the professionalism of what they're trying to achieve. Because it is possible that there is no link here, it is possible that there is no financial motive, uh, there is no evidence to suggest a hard motive outside of a lot of big red flags, but nothing that is concrete evidence. So we will allow for the possibility that CTS Labs is attempting to publish security findings that they believe are in good faith. Uh, however, the professionalism and the mode of publishing that data is suspect, or in the very least unprofessional. And here's another thing. In that Anantac call, which is it's like 30,000 words, it's published on their website, a lot of CTS Labs defenses and defenses to other media were that we're new. We don't really know what we're doing. This is the first time we published something and basically asking for slack. But the entire company background page and all the management profiles brag about how these people have 10 plus years of experience in security research each. So they've made some pretty big mistakes for a new company that claims to have jointly many, at least a couple of decades of experience while still somehow simultaneously being new to the industry. So that's quite some dichotomy there. But uh, that's the update. We don't really have much. Uh, it's possible that there's no link. It's possible there's no financial motive. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that this all looks very strange anyway. Next one is on AMD and the R5-2600X. So this was listed accidentally on Amazon. Not much to say here other than a listing on Amazon Germany accidentally revealed the price and the release date of the AMD R5-2600X. The processor was priced at 250 euro with tax just over 300 US dollars, but pricing is different in different regions. And it was scheduled to become available for purchase on April 19th, which it seems accurate, we'll say. Uh, some extremely basic specs were also revealed on the product page, including frequency base as 3.6 gigahertz and boost at 4.25 gigahertz. Uh, not sure if that's with XFR or XFR2, but XFR2 pushes it a bit further if, if so or if not. Uh, and it's based on 12 nanometer process. So that's all we have for that one. Next one, Intel Meltdown Inspector Patch Performance Updates, also in the news. This is about a week or two prior to the CTS lab story taking over the news cycle. We had a call with Intel, a briefing on their own Meltdown Inspector updates. We've been following this for a while. One of their earlier microcode updates resulted in uh, unexpected reboots and shutdowns on some platforms. So those were all fixed recently. Now there's an update that uh, applies the security updates across the past five years of Intel CPUs. I believe it's 100% of them in the last five years that have been made. These pertain to Meltdown Inspector and should harden security without sacrificing too much performance. On the front of performance, our understanding right now from some research is that it looks, and from talking with Intel, is that it looks like uh, CPUs that are made within the last couple of generations, eighth, seventh, and sixth generation, some fifth, although that's not that popular, should have the lowest performance impact from these microcode updates, often in single digit percentages, depending on how and what you're measuring. 
the older generation systems will experience heavier performance impact. Uh, this is particularly true with responsiveness in SysMark testing. And further, older systems with an SSD will have more significant performance loss than older systems with a hard drive because your bottlenecks change. So as far as numbers, what we've been given from Intel and we have not yet independently validated, so keep that in mind. We'll, we'll look at it eventually, hopefully. But what we've been given for now is uh, SysMark measurements that show on average 6th, 7th, and 8th gen performance loss uh, decaying between uh, or retaining 88% of the maximum performance pre-patch. So you've got a bit of a drop there, 12 percentage points off of baseline 100 or uh, as low as 76% of baseline 100% in responsiveness, which is a metric provided by SysMark. And uh, older systems, again, with SSDs have bigger hits than, uh, than the newer stuff. But for gaming performance, it looks like the newest microcode updates shouldn't really have an impact on gaming. This coincides with what we found previously for Microsoft's own Windows updates. And uh, we'll, we'll look into all of this more once there are a couple more patches. But they're still pushing stuff. So we're just kind of waiting for a good point when everything's stable and it's not getting updated every week. So next one is on NVIDIA's real-time ray tracing announcements that they're making at GDC, Game Developers Conference, not to be confused with GTC, the week following. NVIDIA has been talking about real-time ray tracing for a long time now. Uh, in fact, I remember covering a story from NVIDIA's Tony Tomasi, who actually also presented this one, in, I don't know, many years ago, and he predicted that by 2015, we would have real-time ray tracing in games. So not too far off the mark. But NVIDIA has been talking about it a while, and uh, they have another announcement on the advancement of real-time ray tracing. The company has announced its new NVIDIA RTX, it's called, at GDC, which is a ray tracing technology option for game engines. RTX was demonstrated as running on Volta architecture GPUs and integrates primarily with a new Microsoft DirectX 12 ray tracing API. Alternatively, or in addition to this, RTX can be accessed via GameWorks libraries for developers who opt in. And NVIDIA announced that 4A Games, Epic Games, Remedy Entertainment, and Unity, the engine maker, have already begun working with RTX. A new GameWorks SDK uh, is also upcoming, and that adds support for Volta, architectures, and, maybe more interesting to you all, quote, future generation GPU architectures, and will enable ray-traced area shadows, ray-traced glossy reflections, and ray trace ambient occlusion. These are all, uh, as we understand it, basically what they sound like. Ray traced area shadows should be shadows that are generated based on ray tracing and so forth. So uh, that's that's brief overview. We'll look into this more as software comes out that we have to actually test and play around with. But that's their news. Asus has an ROG X470 board that was leaked, I believe, via video cards. So a picture of the ASUS ROG X470-F Strix motherboard was sent anonymously to videocards.com. Tech PowerUp translates the Chinese characters between the CPU socket and the memory slots as players, indicating that it's a gaming motherboard if the VRM heatsink and I.O. cover didn't already tip you off. And no explanation was offered for the word hybrid or the other characters on the board. But that's all we really know now. It's one of the six known ASUS X470 boards the others listed by video cards are the Prime X470 Pro, the ROG Strix X470i Gaming, and the Crosshair 7 Hero, following up the Crosshair 6 Hero, along with the Tough X470 Plus Gaming. This one's also really quick. ASRock has confirmed officially that they will be making GPUs, or rather video cards, and those video cards will be using AMD GPUs exclusively for now. That's really all we know. They put out a teaser trailer. They showed a dual axial card with an 8-pin power header for specs. That's all we have. They used words like unpredictable and mysterious, which are, of course, two attributes you want in your video card. But uh, that's all we know. So uh, as Rock's getting into GPUs with AMD, the brand will be called Phantom Gaming, and we'll keep an eye on it, but nothing concrete yet other than a firm confirmation from ASRock that this is indeed happening. Next one is Samsung's power outage that killed flash supply. Samsung's massive Piontech fab, which we mentioned in hardware news a couple weeks ago in the context of a second fab opening, experienced a 30-minute power outage on March 9th, 
Reports have since come out stating that 60,000 wafers were damaged due to the outage, which translates to 3.5% of global NAND wafer production, according to Tom's Hardware. We've been keeping track of NAND prices on DRAM Exchange, but they don't appear to have been affected yet anyway. Logitech G has announced a new G560 gaming speaker and G513 mechanical keyboard, both with the Logitech G Light Sync feature to synchronize RGB LEDs to gameplay. Logitech says that both are intended to complement the popular G502 mouse. We're most interested in the G513 keyboard, which will offer a choice of Romer G tactile and Romer G linear switches. The linear switches are new and should be similar to cherry reds, while the tactile ones that have been out a while are similar to damped browns if you were to put a rubber o-ring on them. Unlike the cherry switches that uh, Logitech and others use, typically Romer G's are designed to not let light spill out the sides of the stems. And other than that, according to Logitech, the switches actuate up to 25% faster than the leading competitor, so they say, at a distance of 1.5 millimeters, combined with a low force 45 gram actuation. As for the speakers, those have lighting zones, so you can use software to interact with the RGB LEDs so that the speakers light in different areas based on what is being shown on screen. It's part of an ambient lighting initiative that should be theoretically a bit cheaper. The products, MSRP, $200 for the speakers, $150 for the keyboard. The speakers are two speakers and a subwoofer. Also in audio news, SteelSeries seems to be trotting out a new line of flagship gaming headsets in the new Arctic Pro series. The new headsets are largely similar to one another in aesthetics and use what they call premium flourishes like steel and aluminum, but deviate slightly in configuration. In total, the new lineup is comprised of three models, the Arctis Pro, the Arctis Pro and Game DAC, and the Arctis Pro Wireless. The Arctis Pro sits at the bottom run and is your classic PC headset, and then it goes up from there. Pricing is $180 for the Pro, $250 for the Pro with DAC, and $330 for the Pro Wireless. And then finally, Corsair appears to be continuing its revival of one of their most popular case series. After the recent launch of the 500D Obsidian case, Corsair's newest member appears to be the Obsidian 1000D, ostensibly a successor to the 900D. The new monolithic case will be a super tower capable of housing two separately derived systems. Leaked specs include support for two 480 millimeter radiators, one 420 radiator, one 240 radiator, eight 120 millimeter fans in the front, two 120 or 140 millimeter fans in the rear, and three 140s in the top with six two and a half bays, five three and a half bays, and an integrated Commander Pro lighting system. The styling of the case employs aluminum, steel, and curved tempered glass on hinges, much like the new 500D. The alleged price on this one, $500. Uh, but this is, of course, still a leak, so things could change. That's it for this week. As always, subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, or go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats like this one, which will be shipping within the next couple of weeks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.